Few things fascinate us more than ghost towns. With their eerie carcasses of abandoned buildings, ghost towns are concrete tales of prosperity and decay. They are failed attempts at urbanization, but also a reminder that opportunity moves on. Towns and villages can be abandoned because there's a mismatch between their inhabitants' needs and the resources available, or because something better comes along. There are many reasons for a place to turn into a ghost town. Eagle Mountain in California was abandoned in the early 80s when the main source of income for the town, an iron mine, was shut down. Other ghost towns are created because of a natural disaster, man-made disaster, war. The local bar closes at 6 p.m. When a town lacks resources, job opportunities, or infrastructure, it isn't sustainable and the economy dries up. So people move to the city for better prospects. With most of their workforce migrating to urban areas, rural areas are experiencing severe brain drain because of the lack of employment opportunities, creating hollow villages where most of the population are left behind children and the elderly, a common problem in villages in China. These hollow villages are on their way to becoming ghost towns. But some are smelling new business opportunities. Ma Gongsuo left his village to pursue the dream of higher education and soon discovered that modern tech would allow him to close the urban-rural gap with an e-commerce business. So there's still hope for hollow villages and rural communities that lack urban opportunities. The same goes for urban areas that lack what rural areas can provide, land. Singapore might be the most staggering example of integrating urban convenience and rural resources. The whole nation is smaller than New York City and has very little space to work with. But they lead the world in green architecture and sustainable building design, out of necessity. Singapore became highly innovative. It maximized the space and combined natural elements with urban infrastructure. But there's also no space for rural farming, so they severely lack basic resources such as food and water. Singapore is a very land scarce country and so we use uh, a lot of our land for other economic purposes and that's the reason why we have to import most of our food products from overseas. Land is scarce in Singapore but that's the reason why food imports are generally cheaper and it makes more economical sense for us to bring in products from overseas than to actually produce locally in Singapore. What is not available locally is either imported or created through tech by companies like Artisan Green. They are using technology to make local farming possible again and improve the city's food security and sustainability. The concept behind vertical farming would be looking at uh, growing plants in multiple planes rather than just a singular plane that what we usually see in outdoor field crops. We are growing multiple levels on the x-axis so that within the same footprint, we are able to grow more and be more productive. Recently, we realized that in Singapore, we are totally reliant on overseas imports that has disrupted a lot of food supply into Singapore. And that's the reason why there's a very strong push by the government heading towards a green economy and we have to strive towards sustainability because it's not just about profits. So there are a lot of benefits to vertical farming. One such benefit would be a controlled environment, which means that we get consistency of our yields and also product quality. And the other benefit would be that we don't use pesticides because we are in an enclosed environment. Vertical farming isn't here to replace outdoor farming. I think it's here to grow hand in hand together. The limitations of vertical farming would be the higher costs that we need to produce crops. So due to the need for LED lights, there are certain lower value crops that we can't produce. We can actually grow it, but it doesn't make economic sense. So it's better left for outdoor farmers where you grow things in the broad acre farms under sunlight. 
Looking at Singapore's case is a great example to predict the future, since more than half of the world's population now live in urban areas. While millions keep migrating from rural to urban areas, highly developed places like Singapore are in search of more efficient solutions to the limitations of city living. But the world's urbanization rate has recently dropped, leaving many wondering, do you really need to live in a big city in order to have a convenient and comfortable lifestyle? And how sustainable would it be if everybody moved to urban areas? One of the countries that Singapore imports its food supply from is Indonesia, where 42% of the population live outside of cities. Here, technological development is making rural life more convenient than it ever was. Fishing is one of the biggest industries in the country. Making it more efficient and profitable means more people can choose to be fishermen and enjoy the comforts of a rural lifestyle with the convenience of technology without moving to a city. Local tech startup eFishery is helping fish farmers become more efficient by leveraging automation and AI while reducing environmental impact and addressing their country's own food security issues. I think right now the very least that the technology can do is convenience. They need to go to the pond and then feed manually and that's really hard and uh, demanding work to do that. But with our IoT devices, they just can stay at home and then the device will report to them whether the feed is already fed properly. And the same thing on buying the feed. Initially, they need to go to the store and order the feed. But right now, they just go to the app and order the feed. So they can use their time expanding their business. First, if they use the feeder, we help them to reduce the feeding costs up to 23%. And the feeding cost itself is 70 to 90% of the total operating cost. And by using the same technology, the farmers can also reduce the harvest cycle for three months to two months. So they get more annual yield. And all in all, it can almost like uh, double their profit from 50% to uh, 200%. Karena segalanya seperti mudah setelah bergabung dengan episode ingin menambah kolam lebih banyak lagi, kemudian bisa dapat memproduksi ikan yang uh, lebih banyak. Kalau kemarin rata-rata dalam satu tahun itu ada sekitar 10 ton, nah ke depan harapannya bisa memproduksi ikan bisa lebih dari 20 ton. After the data that we can capture, we can provide cheaper feed as well. Right now we can reduce by 5% up to 10% cheaper. The biggest challenge is convincing the fish farmers to become comfortable with tech. Uh, tantangan terbesarnya karena Evider ini kan teknologi baru, terutama kita di budidaya ikan nila ini. Jadi takutnya karena ini adalah teknologi baru, takut salah mengoperasikan, uh, salah membuka aplikasi seperti itu paling tidak. It's very difficult for farmers to adopt new technology, especially the technology that never used before. When we started, we provided uh, like a mobile-based IoT devices that is cloud connected. And farmers don't get it, right? They didn't even use a smartphone. They don't know what cloud is, what IoT is. And they've been doing the traditional farming for a while, for 20, 30 years. So with this type of technology that never used before, it's so hard for us to convince them on how to use technology and how this is able to help them. By helping them to do everything from ordering food to scheduling feed times to selling their fish in one app, they give them a shot at sharing the benefits of technology urban residents already enjoy. I think technology is very important to improve the, the life of rural people. 44% of the world population is on rural area, right? which means that 3 billion people, so it's a massive uh, amount of population. In Indonesia, it's the same, it's 42% of the Indonesians uh, living in the rural area. But if we see how things are progressing, many innovations of what we call technology is actually uh, designed to provide convenience for people in the urban area. Inclusive digital economy is important because it helps people in the rural area to be part of the economic growth so they can have a better livelihood. And the benefit of doing that, of course, as a whole, like as a population, as a country, then we can have a better prosperity. For example, right now, if we talk about big problems like cl climate change, if people in the rural area don't care about climate change simply because they don't even know what to eat a year after. If we assure that they're pro prosper, we can talk about you know, conservation of, the, of that area. Through working with these farmers in rural communities, urban tech companies like eFishery can learn a lot. It's not just about the technology, but how they can afford the technology that is important for them. I think the smartphone is one of a good examples of that, right? A smartphone, when it is first launched, it's too expensive for everyone. 
but right now when the smartphone is we do have like some Chinese cheap smartphone and people suddenly have access to that and also have access to the internet because internet price is right now very affordable and they can have access to the remaining like content social media information that now available in the internet and the same with that if we want to build technology like devices IoT automation robotics the first step needs to assure that it will be radically affordable uh, so the farmers and people in the rural area can use it, can afford it, for them to get an impact of that technology. Bringing urban technology to rural areas to improve living conditions and economic development is the same strategy adopted by the country with the second biggest rural population in the world, China. While the urbanization rate in China is higher than the world average, with almost 900 million living in cities today, its large population means that over 500 million individuals still live in rural areas. In order to keep up with their increasing urbanization rate, large infrastructure projects have been going up for decades. If you build it, he will come. But if they don't come, then you have what's labeled a ghost city, sprawling apartment buildings and investment projects that lose funding halfway through development. The difference between a ghost town and a ghost city is basically, ghost towns had their time to shine, while ghost cities are still waiting for their big break. Many hollow villages are embracing technology to unlock their potential. They started with e-commerce platforms like Taobao, which allowed people in rural areas to connect with the rest of the country. This gave birth to Taobao villages. Bainio village is an example of a revitalized town. After it was no longer a Ming Dynasty trade route, the masses moved on to better opportunities. Now thanks to Taobao, half of its residents make a living from e-commerce, and it constitutes 70% of the mountain walnut market in China. A more modern version of the Taobao village is exemplified by Ma Gongzuo. He's a beekeeper and a live streamer that sells honey to customers all over China on Douyin. He's part of a new generation of entrepreneurs who are showing young people in rural areas alternatives to leaving their homes for the city, while still being very profitable. Wu 我们就大家一起又把这个今天的直播里面的一个数据啊his clever embrace of technology to grow his business has gained him a lot of recognition in the area. Okay,我们给我们家乡的很多农民，帮他们农农产品卖出去了。很多外面大城市的朋友，他们就是有钱也买不到好的农产品，天然农产品。所以的话，我们就通过短视频直播这个平台，架成了一个城市与农村的交流
and slow down that urban-rural divide. Because 